resume the sitting. Members, I have received notice from the First and Deputy First Minister that they wish to make a statement setting out how the Executive will approach the re- relaxations as the first steps towards a wider recovery process. I have taken the unusual step of allowing today's business to be interrupted because I am aware of the significant interest from MLAs, the general public and the media in relation to this particular issue. Before I call the Minister, I remind members here in the Chamber that in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement have been relaxed. Members participating remotely must make sure their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called. Members present in the Chamber must also do so, but may do so by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or speaker's table directly. I remain members to be concise in asking their questions because there are a lot of members who will want to contribute this afternoon. This is not an opportunity for debate and long introductions should not be engaged in. I also remind members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order are not normally taken during a statement or the question period afterwards. And I call the Deputy First Minister. Thank you for the opportunity um, for allowing us to make this statement here today and for disrupting your business that was planned. Um, I think, um, as we all know, this year we will turn a corner in the COVID-19 pandemic, but there is much more to do and we're not out of the woods yet. For some, this year has been the most difficult year they have experienced, and it was a sad milestone last week when we reached the first anniversary of our first COVID-19 case here. We have sadly lost over 2,000 of our fellow citizens, and over 112,000 of our people have also tested positive. It is, however, time to look to the future, to look to the future with hope, and the conditions for doing that are starting to emerge. The Vaccines Programme is a foundation block for building forward towards our recovery. But the Vaccines Programme cannot take the heavy lifting on its own, especially not at this time, and restrictions will be a fact of life, unfortunately, in some form for some time yet. We are incredibly proud of the vaccines work. The Department of Health has a first-class programme of delivery, and our citizens are responding exceptionally well to the offers of taking the job. As at the 28th of February, there had been 558,597 vaccine doses administered here. This is made up of 525,400 first doses and 33,197 of second doses. That is a crucial step forward. We also continue to see good adherence to the current restrictions, and again, we're very grateful for that too. Consequently, the R number has reduced to between 0.8 and 1.05, and the pressure on our health service has started to reduce. So we believe that now is the time to look forward in a hopeful way, recognising that there is still a huge risk around COVID-19, especially for the potential of new variants. We cannot afford to let the numbers go back up to the point where the health service is overstretched again. Our colleagues, our friends and family who provide health and social care services deserve our duty of care and our ongoing respect. Nor do we want to count Corlea to be in a cycle of opening and closing huge sections of business and society. We must do everything that we can to try to make this one the last lockdown. And with the underpinning insurance policy, that this executive will take the steps needed to protect the health service. Taking all these factors together, we can take some tentative preparatory steps towards the lifting of restrictions. But great care is still required. That is why the Executive has agreed today a careful, cautious and hopeful approach to existing restrictions, and we will be publishing that later today for everyone to see. Can Corley, we want to outline our thinking in this Assembly first. From the very outset of the pandemic, we undertook to keep the Assembly and MLA colleagues up to date, not only on our decisions but on our rationales, and we are glad to do so again today. The Executive's approach will be a cautious one. We have developed a pathway out of restrictions which builds in time between key steps and relaxations. This leaves time for decisions to be properly informed by the health, community and economic data and to see the real-time impact of the prevalence of the virus. That time will be used carefully to look at the results of the regular modelling and to assess if it is safe to take the next step. 
This is a risk-based strategy and one which we hope will be understood in the current COVID-19 context. Our aim is to find a safe, secure, sustainable and understandable way forward for our citizens, sectors and businesses. And we will be hopeful, we will be optimistic and we will be realistic in our pathway. We recognise that our citizens need the hope that they, will under, that they need hope and that they understand that we will need to move carefully through the coming months. Hope and care are equally important and that requires a balanced approach. Our approach is built on some core considerations and we will set those out now. First and foremost, our approach is risk-based and will be driven by health, community and economic data and analysis. We will not be driven by hard dates. We recognise that everyone will be looking for certainty, but we do not want to set, set potentially unachievable dates that will only disappoint. Our commitment is that we will keep restrictions in place only as long as needed, and as and when we build headroom to open a sector, we will most certainly take that opportunity. Second, we will continue to be open and transparent in our decision making. We will keep everyone up to date and we will explain our thinking. Keeping restrictions in place will only be done if that is necessary and proportionate to the threat that we face from COVID-19. Third, we will continue to look holistically at the challenges that we face. While our focus today is on the pathway out of restrictions, we are also working on our building forward recovery strategy. This is where we will draw together the key interventions and the actions that are needed to jumpstart economic and societal recovery. We are joining up the collective effort through the Executive's uh, COVID-19 task force and alongside the Protect and Recovery work streams, we are building an increased focus on adherence and strategic communications. Finally, while we set our own course here, we do not operate in a vacuum. <clears throat> we work closely with other jurisdictions, with the Irish Government, we work closely with um, other administrations on an east-west basis too, and we are willing to learn from what works best elsewhere and we're also willing to share our experiences here. Our pathway includes conditions outlined by the World Health Organization. The executive will, of course, take our own decisions, and we, we have set our own pathway on the basis on which those decisions will be reached. Evidence-based, necessity, proportionality, and sustainability will be key to all decisions. And we'll be driven by health, economic, and societal impacts and will be informed by key data sets in those sectors. We will work towards the gradual and careful reopening of the nine sectors, which are vitally important for our citizens and for their families. These are home and community, education and young people, worship and ceremonies, sports and leisure activities, work, retail, hospitality, travel and tourism, and culture, heritage and entertainment. The pathway looks at each of these nine sectors in detail. It sets out a step-by-step -step process, starting with where we are now and then taking the first cautious steps, gradual easing, further lifting of restrictions and then preparing for the future. It also illustrates our hope and our aspirations for the practical, real-life benefits that this will bring to our citizens. And we're very keen that everyone can find some comfort in the document and what we hope it means for them while seeing the cautious steps we will need to walk through. In line with our commitments on transparency, the pathway also explains how we will take our decisions and the process for that. It sets out the pathway in the context of our plans for recovery. The pathway does not seek to take us back to where we were before the pandemic, and it recognises that there will be some adaptions in our lives. That will be the case across a number of sectors for some time to come. The Executive is, however, committed to getting education back as quickly as possible for the sake of children and young people, for their education, for their well-being and for future aspirations. We will do, so, we'll do this for parents too and in partnership with our colleagues in the education system who are working so hard to adapt to the current pressures. Ken Corlea, it is vitally important that all of this is grounded in the reality of the pandemic. COVID-19 continues to impact every aspect of our lives. The new variants are a sharp reminder of the need for care. Our health responses have developed considerably over the last 12 months, and we have a debt of gratitude to everyone who's worked in the health and care sector. The role we all play this year will be important, and that starts with sticking to the public health basics, 
that remains vital and we will all benefit when we get this right. Washing our hands, keeping a safe distance from others, wearing our face coverings and reducing social contact as much as we can. This makes a real difference and we cannot let those good habits go. Adhering to the remaining restrictions and engaging with our communications have played a key role in getting us to this point where we can start to think about lifting the restrictions. And we really want to say thank you to everyone for all of this. There are new variants and that needs to be guarded against and that is part of the reason why travel is so severely limited and we ask for patience and understanding on that point. COVID-19 is a successful virus because of its ability to transmit between people so easily. The new variants are even more so. So the stay at home message remains important today. We know and understand that people go out for essential reasons, such as shopping and for exercise, for necessities and for wellbeing. But we are concerned about crowded places, even outside. So we continue to ask everyone to take great care and to think about the risks. That is why we've set out very clearly in the pathway the approach we are taking to decision making for everyone to see. Each week, departments will meet as a collective to discuss the available information and to proactively consider which steps can be, be proposed to the executive. After each step that we take, we will pause, we'll reflect, we'll look at the data and the impacts, we'll engage with the key sectors and enable them to reopen only if it's the right thing to do. And I think that gives us all the best chance of achieving sustainable steps and to avoid another lockdown. In summary, Can Corlea, we published our documents today and we ask everyone to take the time to read them, to digest them, to think about the need for caution in our approach, to continue to follow the public health advice and most certainly to take the vaccine whenever it's offered. We all have hope for this year and together we will get through this. Gormagos. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the committee for the executive office, Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the first ministers for their statement today. Um, it is a bit disappointing, however, that MLAs only got this statement 30 minutes before on such a serious issue uh, that is so profound and cuts right across all of society, and that we have yet to be provided with the actual plan, even though some journalists have had versions of this from early this morning. Um, COVID has caused major problems for most in our community, ranging from annoyance and interruptions to matter of financial existence and indeed death for many and grief for many more beyond that. It is not an understatement to say that there is no one in our community that has not been impacted. And managing that has not been easy. And as an executive office, you have gotten some of it right and you have got some of it wrong. But today has to be about looking forward and providing positivity and ambition, something for people to look forward to, uh, as it has been a very long, dark and depressing winter. Now, I want to raise a note of concern, because as I understand it, the Executive Office pathway has nine streams with five stages moving at different speeds, meaning that there are 45 variables moving at different paces for people to engage with. Uh, I can see that causing confusion for people. Uh, and it not being that easy to follow. So can you give us a commitment today here that you will front up a substantial information campaign as part of this, updating people about where we are in each pathway and where we will be going to next? Because people in various trades and businesses will need advance notice about when they will move from each stage to the next and what that means to them. And are you prepared to go on to the airwaves and pledge to people today that this executive office plan will be explained at each stage so that people can get the clarity that they need? Thanks to the member for his question. Can I just correct something that you've said? This is not an executive office plan. This belongs to the entire executive. And it's for us all to work together to get us out of this current uh, phase in terms of dealing with the pandemic. And it's for every department to do the heavy lifting. And it's for every department to engage with the sector in which they uh, are responsible for, and it's for every executive minister to work together, to be in the airwaves, to do everything that we can to communicate this to the public. We actually have, as an executive, uh, just agreed, obviously you know the executive went on into the afternoon, and that's why we were late in terms of even asking the speaker to give us the, the space in the, in the chamber today to make the, esta the statement, but nonetheless we are here, I'm glad we're here. As part of the plan, um, there is a strong communication plan, an engagement plan, because um, whenever it comes to uh, 
getting ready for recovery, for being able to open things up. It's really important that we work with all the different sectors, whether that be sport, whether that be the retail, whether that be close contact um, services, no matter what it is, the executive has committed as part of our plan to work with the sector and we've actually started that process today. So as I deliver this statement on behalf of the executive to MLAs today, there is a parallel process now underway with um, engaging with key sectors. But that's not going to be just done today. That has to be done the whole way through this recovery because it's not uh, going to happen overnight. There's a, there's a, a journey to be travelled here. I think, that, um, I think the plan is a good plan in this way. It's flexible enough to be able to allow us to move at pace where we can and actually slow down a little where we, can, where we need to, if we need to. So I think that um, dealing with the, every sector in a separate way, the nine different pathways, allows people to look at what's important for them and see where they fit into the plan. And I hope that people take some comfort um, from that and that many people get some comfort um, from this. We haven't been um, date-led. We've been, we said we'd be uh, led by the data, the specifics, how the vaccine's going, um, the situation in our hospitals, the, and the pressure in the health service. We've said we will we'll, um, be led by, by um, the transmission of the virus um, and the rollout of, of all these things. I think that all those things in the mix, um, it's really, really important that we take decisions, but that we tell people why we're taking those decisions and we communicate it. So I hope that the communication plan that we've also uh, agreed upon today will allow us to be able to do the very things that the member um, has set out. Okay, and just before I bring in the next speaker, can I just remind the rest of the members that they don't have the same latitude to ask your question as a chairperson, obviously did and appropriately so as a chairperson of the committee. So I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for her statement to that the House after what has been an incredibly difficult year for, for many, not least those who have been so vulnerable and indeed those that who, who, whose families have been bereaved and been unable to process that grief in a normal fashion. Um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister if she would make it clear that these indicators around which the Executive as a whole will take decisions on relaxations will include economic and educational sectors and not just be about the figures that are produced by the Department of Health? Again, thanks to the Member for the question. And I can say to you that we've set ourselves, a, 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 I suppose, a, a range of principles in which we will um, take our decisions. So it's health, community and economy. And um, all three things are obviously crucially important. So it's about the issue of the vaccination rollout. It's about the capacity in the health service. It's about the rate of transmission of the virus. Alongside that, it's about the mental health and physical well-being of all of our people. Because um, this has been one of the most challenging years that, that many of us have been through. And I think that we recognise that. So we want to uh, obviously factor that into our decision making. The education of our children um, and young people and making sure we can and the executive has prioritised the issue of schools being uh, opened safely, uh, the impacts on the more vulnerable in society, which you have referred to, and then obviously alongside that there are the economic impacts, so the impact on workers, on, on, um, on businesses, um, and the availability of economic support to assist businesses. So those three areas will be um, factored into all of our decision making. Nicole Dugabiri. And I genuinely thank the Minister for a really welcome uh, statement and I join with the Chair and been disappointed that I've been following this on social media for quite some time and we really need to fix this um, leakage that's coming out of the uh, Executive. Uh, so can I ask you this question based on part of that? Because you, you said something which was really important, that we will move at pace and we will move slowly where we have to and that's the right thing to do in the various different sectors. But Boris Johnson made a very clear commitment will not go backwards. Uh, will you be able to make that commitment today that once we've gone forward to a phase, there will be no going back? Just on the, on, on the, the point of leaks from the executive, I think that is unfortunate and the media have a, a, not even the final version. So whatever's been leaked has been done in advance of the executive's final considerations. However, um, can I say that um, the approach that we're taking, as I've said, is, is to try to... Well, today we want to give people hope. We want people to know that there's something to grab onto, that we have a way forward. Um, I think we should be very honest with the public also to say that this virus um, is still among us. It's still spread. It's still too high a rate. Uh, there are new variants there. Um, but what we have done today and what we're trying to achieve with this plan is that if we do this in a gradual way, in a very um, considered way, if we work our way through it gradually, 
and be cautious uh, and take the right decisions at the right times, then that mitigates against the risk of going backwards. Nobody wants to go backwards. We only want to go um, forwards here. So um, we have deliberately stayed away from giving dates because I think that gives people false hope and it builds up an expectation that people grab onto and then unfortunately can be disappointed. So um, we're trying to do this with the public, with the sectors, gradually easing our way through this. And we hope that this and we think that this is the best way this plan is the best way to avoid um, any slip back into you know, stricter restrictions again. Nicole Sinead Annis. Gary Muggett, uh, Can Corleone, I want to thank the Minister for her statement today. Um, I think the publication of this Pathway to Recovery document will give our citizens some sense um, that there is an end in sight to, to this unprecedented crisis that we've all had to contend with over the past 12 months. Um, given the experience uh, of coming out of previous lockdowns, can the Joint First Minister um, set out how the Executive will engage with each of the key sectors, um, so such as sport, arts, culture, um, business, and of course the community and voluntary sector, um, so that they can properly prepare for the uh, for the steps that they need to take um, uh, to to aid in this recovery. Thank you. Thanks to the member again for the question, and, and she's right in saying that we've we've been through this before. This is our third reversal out of um, restrictions. So, uh, what we're trying to do is learn from uh, experience of the past and actually find a way to to work in tandem with the sectors where we can. We know, understand absolutely that people need time to plan, to adjust, um, and we want to work with the sectors. That's why the, there's already some discussions happening this afternoon, but we intend as part of our engagement plan to engage with the key sectors, of retail, business, hospitality, sports, the arts. Um, we intend to give as much notice as we can where measures are to be eased, and then we'll do all this in a very balanced way in terms of the health, economic, social and family impacts. Um, the, the member may know that in the past junior ministers would have led a lot of this work around the engagement with the sectors and we would envisage that that again will happen. It's just really important that um, we put as much information into the public domain as possible around our decision making. We inform, we hope that people can see from our plan that it actually sets out how we will make decisions, um, it actually sets out when we're going to make decisions and it sets out that we are going to work with the sectors. So hopefully that gives some comfort um, to, to those sectors that have been so detrimentally impacted um, by the pandemic. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to say thank you today to um, all in the executive. Um, today we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we have a society who for over a year have been struggling, so at least we have something. And that leads me to my question which is today people will see this document and be looking desperately for the date of stage number two that's listed. Um, and I can appreciate that we need to be led by the medical advice. Is there anything that we can tell the public today about, I know it mentions about the 16th of March will be an executive review date. Is there anything that we can give for the public to help get them an aim towards the future of when they can look forward to our section two and the document being released? Member for her positive um comments in terms of the hope, because I think this is a day of very much of hope, and um, even though we're saying that people be very cautious and be steady as you go, but, we, but there is a way out, and this is where we're, where we're headed. Um, in terms of like, the, the, the different phases, so nine pathways, five different steps across them, um, and you can move at different, different speeds across each one, but we have set out that we will review the process every four weeks. And so the first date, which we previously had announced, was the 18th of Mar or 16th of March. Actually, is going to be our review date, where there will be a paper comes forward um, from Health that will actually set out. So here's what we can do next. I would caution and, and be upfront enough to say that we don't expect there to be any sort of major change before Easter. Um, but we hope that you know, on the, on the other side of Easter, that there will be room and flexibility. So our dates for the comprehensive reviews by the executive are the 16th of March, the 15th of April, the 13th of May. On the 10th of June, so people, you know, probably in their own heads will, will compute that to a, a sort of time frame. However, um, they are review points in time. It uh, doesn't mean we can do everything within, within each step of those periods. It will depend on all the other um, factors, but it gives people a bit of a judgment in terms of what it is that we're trying to aim for. I call Paula Bradley. Speaker, can I also thank um, the Deputy First Minister for the statement here today. Uh, Minister, I note that where you've uh, 
put down all of the nine sectors. I, maybe I read too much into this, but hopefully that is not in order of when we might see um, the easements on that. And I notice number four is sports and leisure. I just want to ask, has the, the executive given sufficient importance to sports and leisure when it comes to mental health and physical health of our greater population, and just especially our young people, when we need to see that easement happen sooner rather than later? I couldn't agree more. I mean, this has been such a desperate year for, um, particularly for for everybody, but for children and young people in particular, um, who've been denied access. They haven't been in school with their their peers, their friends. They haven't been able to go to their sports clubs, do whatever it is that they're um, interested in. So our priority is to get um, children back out into the outdoors as quickly as possible. I am glad to say, in terms of our of our pathway document, um, one of the first. Um, if you move to the first step in terms of sport, it actually looks at actually being able to give us give more flexibility to um, to children and young people, and we will see um, organised sport, outdoor sports facilities will reopen for training and organised group activities. That's young people getting together for their sports clubs, um, whatever it is, 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 is they're interested in. Um, there'll be some outdoor sport. Sorry, specifically mentions outdoor sport can for children can resume. Um, with a company and responsible adults allowed to attend. So that's your Saturday morning, you know, maybe games that, 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 that many children have been denied because of the pandemic for the last year. And we're looking at in that first phase, hopefully, another area that we've looked at is around um, outdoor competitive sport being able to resume. So given how important sport is to our physical and mental wellbeing, then I think this is uh, something positive, I think, for, particularly for children and young people that can look at this and think, well, we're in the first category, so hopefully that's not too far off. Call John O'Dowd. I can call you and I thank the Joint First Minister for the statement today and welcome the publication of the Pathway Report. Uh, the, the, there's much debate, and even in the Chamber today, around data v states. Uh, would the Joint First Minister agree with me that COVID doesn't have a calendar, it doesn't have a diary secretary, it doesn't work to dates? But what it does work to is human behaviour, and that's why I think, in terms of the plan, it is correct that we're operating to data. Would the Minister further outline as to why it's important that we operate in regards to that data? I think the Minister outlined that it's economic, health and community, rather than dealing simply with dates. Thanks to the member. And, and we think that this is um, the, the best way to be upfront, to be honest with people around what it is that we're facing into. We're not out of the woods and we have a difficult um, weeks and, and months ahead, actually. And there are so many uncertainties with COVID-19 that it's really hard to be definitive at times. But as you have recognised, um, we're judging our ability to move based on the capacity in the health service and the vaccination programme that it remains on track and that our test and trace and protect strategy is doing its job. And also we're going to be rolling, there'll be, our health will be rolling out um, additional testing in, in different settings. So all these things allows us to, to have optimism. But I think that um, the data not dates approach essentially means that each time we take a step, that we will take a step back to, in terms of our own decision making, we'll pause, we'll reflect, and we'll look at the impact of that. We'll engage the key sectors, and then we'll plan for what comes next. So I think this gives us uh, an ability to move forward cautiously, but also to move forward um, based on the evidence that we have in front of us and in conjunction working with the sectors. I'll call Paul Given. Mr. Speaker. Um, People will look at this document and ask the question, what does it mean for them and when? That will be the first reaction. And then they'll want to understand the parameters by which those decisions are being informed. So data is very important, but it is the analysis of that data that then leads to the decisions, which is going to be the test for the executive. And Deputy First Minister, you have said that this plan gives flexibility to move more quickly. If that is the case, given that today's data has our transmission rates where they were last September, given that we have the vaccination programme and we are much further ahead than the Republic of Ireland, um, Scotland, Wales, England will all have their children back to school. Is this not a, an opportunity to prove, as this party wants, that our children are prioritised and they're brought back more quickly, given that the, de the data provides the evidence for that decision to happen? Well, I mean, you can interpret the data in whatever way you wish, um, but I think that we are in a different uh, position here than the, if you compare it as to what's happening in the 26 counties, what's happening in England, Scotland or Wales. Um, our rates per 100,000 are, are higher than elsewhere. So it's really, really important that 
um, that we take all these things um, into account. I'll remind you that uh, your party is also in the executive and agrees with this approach. This is the plan that we've all signed up to. Um, but listen, I think this is not a day for the vision. This is a day to show a united front that we want to get to the other end of this as quickly as possible, that we'll pull out all the stops to do so, but that we must be very cautious in doing so. Uh, if you remember what happened last September, October, November, December, and where we ended up in January, nobody wants to be there again. The health service staff don't want to be there again. So everybody needs to um, put their shoulder to the wheel. Every minister and the executive, every elected representative needs to be responsible. And I know there'll be a temptation to, to move very quickly to, for, you know, what about this sector, that sector and the other. This is a planned way to do it. There's no room for it to be haphazard about this. It needs to be done gradually. It needs to be done in a sustainable way because we don't want to go back into it again. So let's take our time, move cautiously. Our priority is to get children back into school safely. That's what the document says um, again today. Uh, we've already announced two phases in terms of schools. Uh, we've also said in the document that um, after Easter we'll commence on to the next phase, and that's where we should be. And we've, the executive as a whole has prioritised um, getting children back into school, but it must be safe. And there are so many variables right now. We have to also be careful and be very, very cautious. But today is a day of hope, and that's the, what I want the, the public at home to feel from what we're doing here today. I call Colin Gillerney. Gorham Agat, Chan Horlia, and uh, Gorham Agat, Joint First Minister, for the, for the statement and, and the answer to questions today. And I suppose I want to particularly welcome within the document the uh, acknowledgement of the uh, willingness and the recognition of the ability to learn from other places that have done better in this pandemic and previous uh, pandemics. And also, I, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the very significant contribution. Uh, to this in terms of um, experts and academics who have, both in the Health Committee and in other fora, contributed to this. But uh, despite the enormous difficulties that we have faced as a society over the past 12 months, this strategy for recovery also does prevent an opportunity to do things differently and indeed that we strive to do things better moving forward and not simply returning to normality, but doing better. As part of that building back after the pandemic, will the Joint Force Minister commit to ensuring that there is equal consideration given to social improvement as well as to economic recovery? Thanks to the member for, for the question. And, and absolutely, yes, I think that we have an opportunity to, to, to build. And I think that this is only the first step. So the executive, in terms of our pathway out of restrictions, have clearly set out that we have three sort of layers of work to, to take forward. The first is this piece of work, which is lifting the restrictions, and that builds the foundation for short to medium term recovery. Then, secondly, it's about in the short to medium term recovery, what are the interventions that jump starts the longer term renewal, both um, economic and community and societal renewal. And then the third phase of that work is around the renewal and the programme for government um, outcomes and the longer term aspirations. But I think that um, there has been so much good um, over the course of last year, and so many people have adapted what they do, whether that be healthcare students stepping up to the front line, social workers stepping up to the front line, people that have retired coming back into the health service, businesses repurposing their um, businesses. You know, the, the, the sports sector right across the, the sporting code stepping up and helping communities. The work has just been amazing. I hope we never lose that um, again. And I hope that we help the, to, in terms of, of building for, for something better into the future, then we have to have a clear focus on protecting jobs and livelihoods. It has to be about a more inclusive, a more caring society. It has to be about a whole of government and a whole um, of society approach. And particularly, if, if there's one thing the pandemic has certainly exposed, it's the fact that um, over the course of this year, the pandemic has um, disproportionately uh, impacted on those who are more, uh, more vulnerable in society, those um, families that are living in poverty, those families that are living in crowded um, homes, those families that are uh, working on um, low incomes. Um, it's particularly hit uh, women who have usually shoulder more of the care and responsibility. So all of these things, uh, certainly for me, is it, this has highlighted it and that what we need to do now in terms of building for the future is how do we build a different and a better society and that has to be the outworking out of the executive's pathway for recovery, it's certainly um, where I would be focused. Paul Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for uh, the statement today. It is disappointing, as a member of this House, Deputy First Minister, that the pathway document has made its way onto the TEO website before it's been circulated to MLAs. 
The communication strategy really needs to change with members of this Assembly urgently. It is long past uh, due. Uh, just in relation to the document, it is welcome that we finally got this document, Deputy First Minister, and you are right. It, has said, uh, it is to be said that it offers some hope to people who have been at home for some time. There are many couples that are hoping to get married. Many in the last year have delayed uh, their ceremonies uh, because there was uncertainty over whether or not there would or would not be a reception because of the level of infection in communities. But now, with this document, Deputy First Minister, could you provide some clarification as to when those who are planning to get married can do so with members of their family in attendance, be it 25, 50, or otherwise? If you could provide some clarification, it would be very welcome. Thank you. Can I say that um, I have also um, spoke with many very disappointed brides throughout the course of this year because this pandemic has been so detrimental in so many ways to the really important times in people's lives, milestones in people's lives. Um, I am, uh, in terms of the, the worship and ceremonies, actually, in the last, I think it was last week, uh, the junior ministers have had a meeting with the um, faith leaders, and we believe there's going to be a recommendation coming forward to the executive around um, how we can return services of in places of worship, so including weddings, uh, the ceremony part, um, obviously, in um, back to where it was previously, if you remember, there was a risk assessment and mitigation. So we expect to receive a, a paper on that. Um, I think it's imminent. Um, and I think that will hopefully then give some assurance and clarity to, to those um, couples that are, that are waiting to know if they can have their wedding reception and, or wedding, their wedding ceremony and the size. I think the reception end of, of things will be a bit of a bit of a period away, obviously, if you look towards the the, um, the hospitality piece, um, it'll be a, a bit of time before you'll be able to get back to, to larger numbers there. But um, there is, it is a hopeful day as well. And we hope that to give people the, um, the clarity uh, as quickly as we possibly can. And we will not keep these restrictions in place for any longer than is necessary. Nicole Allen Chambers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy First Minister, you quoted in your statement the fact that over 2,000 people have died and over 112,000 people have, passed, uh, have tested positive. And I think it demonstrates the scale of this pandemic. And I think today is a day when our thoughts, uh, all, of, all in this House, will be with uh, those people and their families. Uh, we certainly do have something to be proud of uh, with our vaccination programme, and it does offer hope. And you have acknowledged in your statement, Deputy First Minister, that vaccinating on its own will not defeat this pandemic. You also acknowledge the good adherence to the current restrictions, and you have reinforced the need uh, to continue for us all uh, to work together. Uh, I'd certainly like to take this opportunity to place on record the huge debt that we owe to our own medical and scientific experts. But would you agree that there continues to be a huge responsibility on the shoulders of all public representatives who serve in this House and other places not to say or do anything to undermine the corporate public health messages. Thank you. Thanks to the member. And can I say, I mean, I absolutely um, concur in terms of the vaccination rollout. It's been excellent, and all credit to the, the teams of people that have been working to get, uh, to get that rolled out. And also, um, listening this morning to, to um, the reports around the, the vaccination centre at the, at the SSA Arena, I think, again, shows another positive step forward in terms of vaccination. So yes, the message here is consistent across the executive. The message here is consistent for um, us all. Um, this, is, this is a day of hope. This is a day of optimism. This is a day for us to, to look to the future, but to thread carefully as we walk our way through it. And I think that um, if we're all, uh, if we continue to, to communicate this in the right way to the public, then that, I think, will help bring the public with us because it's very understandable that people are tired of COVID. We're one year um, going through this. and. Everybody has been denied so much, um, whether that be um, you know, family gatherings. There's been just so many milestones, birthdays, everything that people have missed. And they'll want um, to be able to, to know when they can get there again. And we'll get there quicker if people help uh, work with us just through this next uh, period of time till we get to the, to the end of the, of the, um, the current restrictions. Oh, William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her statement today? What encouragement can she give to business owners desperate to get their businesses open again? Uh, many of these uh, have been at wit's end corner. What encouragement can the Deputy First Minister give to those businesses? 
Well, as the member knows, the pandemic has been detrimental to many of our businesses, and particularly um, small businesses. There are so many people still in furlough. I mean, the consequences of, of the pandemic are enormous, and we're dealing with it every day. We've, we've done our best in terms of trying to be able to financially support businesses, obviously, to get through the pandemic. And the, the furlough obviously has helped, but it is very challenging for, for businesses. That's why we've committed to, in our plan, to say that we're going to take into account the health implications, the community implications and the economic implications, and that's what will help inform um, our decisions. We have no desire to keep any business's door closed for any longer than necessary. We have a priority to save lives and we have a priority to, to uh, make sure that we do our best for the public, but it has to be done in a, in a staged way. And I think this offers us the best opportunity to get to the other end of these restrictions in as quick a possible manner. Can we please bring Karen Mullen into the spotlight, please? Karen Mullen, could you ask your question, please? I also thank the Minister for the statement um, and welcome the hope that it provides. The Joint First Minister will appreciate the enormous contribution that sports and sporting bodies make to our health and wellbeing. Coming through this pandemic, children have been at home for months. Many parents were anxious to know when their children and young people will be able to return to sports. Minister, how can we assure parents um, that it is safe for them to return those children to return to sports and support our sporting clubs to reopen? Thank you um, to the minister. That's my first question from Starleaf. So, um, your experience. Um, can I <clears throat> can I say that obviously, and I, I, I mentioned it earlier in a question I got um, from Paula in terms of um, children and young people. They need to be outdoors, they need to be exercising, they need to be back at their sport. Certainly that's what I get in my own family um, from, from the young people and certainly I know it's the, the concern of many, many parents. So the pandemic has denied children so much over the past year and we're determined to get uh, things opened up um, as quickly as we possibly can in this, in this area because we know how important um, sport and leisure is to physical and, and mental health. And even for just to get together, it's about team building, it's lifelong bonding, it's you know, it's 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 all of that. So, um, I am delighted that that in terms of the first um, step around sports and leisure activities, that we actually and we had a discussion on this at the executive that we actually have made a commitment to uh, resume outdoor sport for children, um, and that, that is in that first phase. So, hopefully, we can get there um, fairly quickly. Oh. All being well, things continuing as they are. Um, the public continuing to work with us, then um, I would be um, pleased if we can get there um, fairly, fairly soon, because it is so, so important that, that we can get to that point um, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, as has been mentioned, children and young people have paid a great price for the safety of others during this pandemic. And as a youth sports coach myself, can I also welcome the scheduled return of outdoor youth sport training and games without spectators at stage two of the sport and leisure pathway. I also note the commitment to publish a building forward recovery strategy. Uh, so can I ask if and when you will also publish a children and young people's recovery strategy, including educational, emotional and physical recovery for all children and young people. So the executive hasn't discussed that, but I think it's a very good idea. I mean, why would we should be putting particular emphasis on um, children and young people? I mean, we've, we've talked about them in terms of the overarching plan, but in terms of specifics for the year ahead and the couple of years ahead, what can we do to try to support children and young people, whether that be in the school setting, in the sports setting, in, in, in community. Um, so I'm more than happy to take that back to the executive and just to see if there is something more we can do to progress it. Um, um, and I too thank the Minister for the very welcome statement. As she stated herself, it is really important that we give people hope for the way forward. As the Minister will be very aware, the pandemic has highlighted and in some ways reinforced um, social and economic and health inequalities across, across our communities. Um, it has exposed some very difficult issues that need to be addressed in a strategic way um, going forward. Can the Minister set out how the Executive will address these issues as we move forward to recovery and try to build uh, a different and better society? Thanks. Um, and again, I mean, I think it's really, really important, and I touched on this earlier, that we try to build a better society on the other side of the pandemic. And I'd, I'd pointed out that 
um, in rebuilding the, our, our community after the pandemic. It has to be about how do we target those who are more in need, those in housing need, those who are living in poverty, um, those people that are, that are living in, in overcrowded homes. Um, homelessness has obviously increased also during the pandemic. So a lot, of the, a lot of the work, a lot of good work actually has been done through the Department of Communities in supporting um, targeted groups. However, I do think that there is an awful lot more to be done. I think that particularly when I reflect on the impact of the pandemic on women, for example, I think that there's a huge um, issue there that, that needs to be addressed. Many, as I said, many women um, bear the, this, I suppose the, the majority of, the, of care and responsibility and that thing. We also know there's been a rise in domestic violence. Um, which has been particularly alarming throughout the course of the pandemic. So there's a lot of things that we need to do to build a better society, and that has to be a major factor in terms of the economic recovery and the pathway that we are adopting. Can we please bring Cara Hunter into the spotlight, please? Cara Hunter, can you, you ask your question, please? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister for her answers so far. Uh, looking through the pathway, it is welcome that one of the strategic priorities uh, is maintaining the health and well-being of all our citizens. Given the welcomed pace of the vaccine programme so far, what plans does the executive have to introduce an improved, full-scale and comprehensive track and trace system? And what further steps have been considered, which means future outbreaks can be contained so that we're not having to reverse any further steps in this plan? Thank you. Thanks to the member for her question. Um, she'll note if she has um, seen the pathway that it talks about that there have been a major number of developments in terms of the health front and obviously in terms of track trace and, and um, isolate systems that comes under the remit of the Department of Health and it's for them to bring forward improvements. Certainly I agree with you. That is the best way in which we can target the virus, we can track the virus and we can isolate it down. So I think that if we were it, from the very outset of the pandemic, the, the World Health Organization were saying that for us to be successful in terms of dealing with the pandemic, then we needed to have a first class test, trace and isolate system. So I do welcome the fact that uh, in the pathway to recovery, there are comments that are, there are a commitment actually in terms of the Department of Health and the work that's going to be done there. And we need to be very focused on that. Alongside that, actually, there's going to be additional testing. Um, there's talk of developing the testing within schools, so lateral flow tests, quick tests that can be uh, turned around. All these things combined will give us uh, the best possible chance of being able to lift all the restrictions. It will not be one thing. We should not put all our eggs in the vaccine basket because clearly um, whilst the vaccine is hugely uh, effective, um, it does not stop. We do not have evidence to say that it stops the spread of the virus. So we need to um, have a combination of, of efforts and make sure that we use implement every one of them um, faithfully in order to give us the best possible chance. Okay, and before I call the next speaker, I just want to remind people there's a number of people still wanting to speak and contribute to ask their question. So I would ask everybody to be as succinct as possible. Pat Sheehan. I thank the Minister for her statement today. Uh, and the publication of this pathway document uh, will be welcomed by most people across our communities uh, insofar as it signals a return to some sort of normality in our lives. I'm wondering, can the Minister detail the process that will determine movement between the different uh, phases and the easing of restrictions? Gurma Abbott. Yep, thanks to the member. As, as I've said, the executive recovery document outlines the five phases and how we plan to reduce and then also ultimately to remove the restrictions that are currently in, in place. But we'll have to use a broad range of data, um, information and also statistical indicators to inform decisions on the relaxation um, of restrictions or whether we need to return to strengthen them, which we're obviously trying to avoid. So I think that all the factors that I've talked about, the fact that we're making rapid progress when it comes to the vaccine, um, the, the, but it's really, really important that alongside that, that we suppress the virus, at, and that has to be at the forefront of our considerations across all phases and beyond. Because you see, if we move too quickly, we could end up with transmission rates um, rising so fast that our health service then becomes overwhelmed again, and we want to uh, avoid that. The other thing is that with the emergence of the new variants, I think it's even more important for us to be um, cautious in our approach. But I can say to the member that there will be linkages and interdependencies across the various pathways and that that's critical because taking action in, in one area may require action in another. So I think it's really, really important that 
we sequence all these things, um, that we be as careful as, as we can, but that we follow the pathway that, um, that we have set out and we consider at all times the pathway as a whole. Call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy First Minister made reference to the impact of the pandemic on women, but it was on the 16th of November last I asked the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister for the reaction to the Women's Policy Group COVID Recovery Plan, Feminist COVID Recovery Plan. That's more than three months ago, and I've heard nothing. Well, I'm more than happy to get back to the member. I know you did raise it here as part of question time. Um, I'm absolutely all for a feminist recovery plan, and I'm more than happy to make sure that factored into all the decisions that we're taking as an executive as a whole um, is that we actually take, in bo take on board the fact that um, there has, the pandemic has been so detrimental towards women, disproportionately actually, towards women for a whole variant of reasons. I actually have had... Uh, and quite a number of engagements with, with the women's sector, also with um, women in business, for example, around how we can build a, a fair recovery, particularly in relation to women, and that's all incorporated into the work that we do every day. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for coming to Minister. Additional certainty for business is obviously welcome, but there will be many disappointed uh, that this statement and the accompanying infographic will not allow them to make the important decisions needed to protect jobs. Will the Executive Office provide a more detailed breakdown for business owners? I think I have set out um, clearly in terms of uh, what our next steps are. This is, uh, sets out the pathway. It lets people see the, the five areas and steps that we will take. It also gives a commitment to work with the sectors, including the business um, community, around where they fit in that, um, how we get ready for them opening, because this should be about getting ready to open. Um, so we have committed very strongly to working with the sector to allow them to get to the point where they can open as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, but most importantly, as sustainably as possible. Call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Deputy First Minister for her comments so far and her answers so far. Obviously, one of the most fundamental questions we have here is people's confidence in the executive and the political message going forward to do that. Can the First and Deputy First Ministers assure us and the people of Northern Ireland that they will maintain the message and have their political parties roll in behind it? Can I um, hope that um, certainly I'm making this statement today on behalf of the entire executive. Can I hope that, um, that all ministers work together, that all elected representatives, chairs of committees and everybody else works together to deliver what is a collective message? I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Deputy First Minister for making the statement today. Uh, yet again, members of this House had the discourtesy of having to get the information regarding this statement from the media. The document excel itself looks like a copy and paste job of what was published last May, and that plan wasn't worth the paper it was written on. So I would like to ask the Deputy First Minister is the Executive finally ready to take politics out of a response to COVID 19, and what input has the Executive Task Force or the Expert Task Force had in this recovery plan? What role will it play in moving? forward to ensure that it's not going to be about competing political priorities? Well, you know, um, the member refers to uh, not playing politics, so I would encourage that to be the case also today in terms of this statement. This is an executive statement. It's all ministers working together. It's a collective effort. It's to try to get us out of the, the path. It's to give us a pathway out of um, the restrictions. I'm very hopeful about it. I believe that it is the right pathway to take us out of restrictions. I certainly have never played politics in terms of the pandemic, and I never would do so. It's really, really important that all ministers work together, that all elected representatives work together. This is a very um, serious situation. It's been a very difficult year. However, people have reason to, be, um, to have optimism. People have reason to look to the future with, with some degree of confidence. Um, but what we need to do is take them out of it in a staged way. Um, more than happy if the member has any ideas of her own, if she wishes to send them to me, I'm more than happy to listen to her in terms of her own approach and how else that she thinks that this plan could be improved. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Well, other regions have been given hope and dates. We have been given a cliche ridden algorithm for dither. It's not much of a sat-nav if it doesn't tell you the route or when you expect to get there. High-sounding cliches about being data-driven, of course, are really about 
providing opportunities to cover executive indecision and disagreement, but they do nothing to answer the questions that ordinary people have. When can we get our kids permanently back into school? Not on some hokey-cokey basis. When can we get our businesses open? When can we get our kids back to playing sport? When can families again engage in recreation and use their caravans and whatever? Those are the questions people want answered. All we have today is a maybe, maybe. It's not good enough. Well, the member in his typical negative form uh, makes his views known. But I'll tell you when kids will be back in school, when it's safe. I'll tell you whenever businesses will be opened, whenever it's safe. I'll tell you whenever children can get back to playing sport, when it's safe. I'll tell you when families can get back together again, whenever it's safe. That's the most important thing, uh, Can Corley. If we can go through, the, deliver this pathway, work our way through this in the most sustainable way, this needs to be sustainable. None of us want to roll back. We only want to make progress. And the best way that the public um, can have confidence that we're only going to keep going forward is if, after, if we actually work our way through this in the, in the staged approach which has been set out. Uh, we do not want um, families apart for any longer than necessary. We don't want business doors closed for any longer than necessary. We don't want um, friends uh, kept apart. We don't want all the detrimental um, realities of life that we're facing because of this pandemic to continue for any longer than necessary. But I do believe this pathway gives us the best, the best um, plan to take us out of the current period of restrictions. We call Jerry Carl. Thank you. Uh, with these announcements, more questions to the RAs and hope more time can be set aside to discuss and scrutinise this document. In the leaked document, Minister, uh, section in relation to work, stage two will see relaxation of restrictions in workplace attendance, whereas stage two of home and community uh, life retains uh, home and community life. Uh, serious restrictions on households and private life remain. So, to me, this repeats making the same mistakes of the past. Huge restrictions on private lives, yet uh, people forced into unsafe workplace uh, conditions. So, what assurances can the minister give that there will not be a repeat of the old mistakes uh, of the past and pushing people into unsafe work uh, conditions uh, when it's not safe to do so? Well, I can certainly say that no one should be forced to go into an unsafe workplace. We've made that very clear the whole way through the pandemic. Employers need to be responsible. They need to allow staff to work from home where they can. Um, if staff are staff that need to go to work, then there needs to be strong mitigation in place. So I, I think I uh, remember previously at some stage in, the, in one of these debates that I actually encouraged the member um, who had concerns to raise them with the relevant authority, whether it be the local council or the HSE, if there's any issues in terms of staff. That should always be the case, and it's incumbent upon us all to do so. The difficulty in all of this is, is to try to get the right balance and to try to allow um, the maximum amount of things uh, being lifted, the maximum amount of restrictions being lifted with the least amount of risk. And that's challenging. And it's particularly challenging around our family lives. And I mean, we all miss um, our families at, at this period of time. We in this chamber are no different um, to anybody else in that, in that regard. And I think um, the, the, the challenge that we have, um, certainly from the health point of view and the, and the, the public health advice, is always that whenever we're together, you naturally let your own yard down, which is it's just what you would do because it's the nature of, of life. And that's why those things perhaps take a little bit longer. But I do welcome the fact that, for example, from um, the 8th, that you know, more people can get together outside from two families. That's going to be an improvement. Um, and then I think I welcome the fact that if you walk across the, the different steps in, in, in terms of home and community life, then you can see that you know, we'll be able to move quickly to try to get that um, back to some sort of sense of normality for people over the course of, of the plan. Look, I, as I said, none of us want to see families uh, apart for any longer. This has been one tough year and we want to remove these restrictions as quickly as possible, but we need to do it in a safe way. Otherwise, we'll be back to square one. And can we please bring Claire Sugden into the spotlight, please? Can I invite Claire Sugden to ask her a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon, members, and also thank you to the First and Deputy First Minister for their statement this afternoon. It is clear that the virus is responding to the virus 
vaccination programme, but I also expect it's responding to the change in season. Autumn, winter will come again. Um, Variants, as the Deputy First Minister has discussed, there could be a spike toward the end of the year. Um, I think it was yourself, Deputy First Minister, perhaps the First Minister who said in November that we need to learn to live with the virus. How do we do that? Because we can't keep finding ourselves in restrictions and lockdown um, and shutting down our economy and our society. Thanks to the member for for that question. And actually, that is one of the things that we factored in. So it's about resilience into the future. So we obviously want to be able to get to the point now where we can lift these restrictions, but we have to be very much also focused on how do we make sure that things are resilient um, into the future. So what are the mitigations that we put in place that uh, preempting what potentially could happen in the autumn again? Um, Because you're right, actually, um, it is the season change. It's a combination of of things probably that actually has us in the position that we are um, today. We know that the virus is, is seasonal. So part of the, the plans for the future, if you like, as we go through this, is um, what are the resilient things that we need to put in place to allow us to cope with that in, in the autumn. So it is factored into the, to the plan. And members, that concludes questions on the statement. Thank you all for your contribution. And could members please take their ease for a moment or two? Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Standing Order 18A dictates operations on oral ministerial statements. 18A2 holds that the Minister shall make a written copy of the statement available to members as early as possible and at least 30 minutes before delivering the statement to the Assembly.